Hey everyone, before we begin the episode, Artist Decoded is offering $25 off of Nick Rungi's video workshop series, Exploring Portraits in Watercolor. It's jam-packed with over three hours of instructional content, including three demos within the workshop series. Just go to nohwaveacademy.com forward slash Nick dash Rungi. Type in AD Rungi 25 in all caps at checkout for $25 off. Now, on to the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode number 110 of Ars Decoded with portrait and figurative painter and artist Nick Runke. Nick began his career in the arts in 2004. After 2006, he started to work with comic book mega companies such as IDW and Dark Horse. Soon after that, he ventured into the world of film art and traditionally painted projects but now spends a majority of his time focusing on his fine art and personal artworks. Nick is a really good friend of mine. We actually just released a video workshop series for him, which is available through our new online workshop platform, No Wave Academy. Nick has also been featured in a couple of our group shows through No Wave, and he's just a really amazing person, so I was really fortunate to have this conversation with him. Nick had a lot of insightful things to say in this episode, too. We talk about his transition from being a professional illustrator to working as a fine artist and the experiences he's encountered through that transitional phase. We also got into a conversation about Nick's love for film, which led us to talking about Apocalypse Now, which is a really amazing film that I like from director Francis Ford Coppola and a few other films. I also really loved his cruise ship analogy, which I won't explain because you'll have to listen to the whole episode for that little gem. If you'd like to, please go to our website, artistdecoded.com, click on the donate link, and it'll direct you directly to our PayPal. And if you can't donate, don't worry about it. Go to our iTunes page and leave us a shining five-star review. Every single review counts, so please do so if you can. It helps for listeners just like yourself to find out about this podcast. So here it is, without further ado, episode number 110 with painter and artist Nick Rungi for Artist Decoded. Hope you enjoy. just run it from the top and like how did you even decide to get into painting or decide to you know start drawing and yeah um for me that's it's really easy just right off the bat both my parents are artists so i'm sure that's the reason that um one of the many reasons they got together you know what kind of artists my mom was always a graphic designer Um, and my dad taught drawing and painting and art history and, um, all that stuff. So it was, I was really, really fortunate now when I look back to think I got both, both sides of kind of the real world artistically, you know, you get the conceptual part, um, the basics as far as drawing and painting and all that. And then the other side, you get clients and dealing with business and dealing with design elements, Yeah, you know, so it's really nice. And my brother's benefited from it too. He's a really, really good painter. And I don't even want to just pigeonhole him as a painter because he's a far, he has a far more open mind, I think, as far as what you actually decide to create. So I really look up to what he puts down on paper or anything he does is really, you know, inspirational. Wow, so a whole family of artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it was just, I don't know if I would have done it, honestly, if it wasn't for my parents or my dad showing me like this is how you apply paint and stuff and i think people naturally if you if you like the feeling you get from your parents which is not always the case i think you probably want to do what they do you know yeah not always but i certainly did because it was if you have artists for parents you're going to naturally i think 
look at the world the way they do at first, at least. Yeah. So there was obviously a, well, you can also see the a shit ton of rebellion within there, you know, that I got into. I'm sure, but yeah, that's I think pretty natural. But at least if you have artists as parents, then you can see the possibilities of what can happen or how it can be viable. I mean, mm-hmm. given how much your parents want to clue you in, mm-hmm. you know, on how like the intricacies of like running a business and being an artist for a living works, mm-hmm. but. Oh, exactly. Yeah. That, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So then, I mean, did you s- decide like right at the get go that you were going to be an artist the rest of your life, you know, and, you know, when you were a teen, maybe? I think it, well, when I was a teen, it was actually the time that I did the least amount of kind of visual creation, which is interesting. Like when I was a kid, definitely, if you ask me, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to be an artist, you know? And so I thought that was really good. And you think, well, how seriously can you take anything when you're five or six, you know, but try to tell that to a five or six year old. They're deadly serious about it. So, yeah, I think I always had that safety zone around drawing or painting or it was like, even if I was unfortunately, you know, comparing myself the way people you compare yourself to other people, I still just always felt like safe when I was drawing. When you're at school, everything was just completely terrifying to me socially and, you know, physically trying to do sports and things that did not come naturally and i don't even think drawing came naturally i think the desire did so that was i'm really thankful i don't necessarily think there was any kind of special ability but just the desire to want to do it you yeah know? so you're just naturally going to gravitate towards that yeah how were you as a kid because you told quiet, me in very shy oh, oh yeah definitely. yeah no no because you've told me in different occasions mm-hmm. that you were yeah like a very quiet and shy person but mm-hmm. i mean was it was drawing and painting a way for you to kind of escape social interactions or how did you Definitely. use that as like a certain device you know for yourself to like cope with just like you know being a kid growing up i think being an artist or at least trying to be an artist has always just been an identity so I just wanted to like everybody wants to know who they are. I don't think we ever figure that out completely. But as far as what somebody asks you right away, like, what do you who are you? What do you do? You know, I would always just want to say I'm an artist. So I think Even nowadays it's more of like painter because I'm just painting more yeah. than anything, you know. But yeah, as a kid, definitely because it was a way to yeah communicate with people. Whereas like at first I don't say anything usually for a long time and you get I have a lot to say you know but i just don't want to sound stupid or something and i think we all feel that way do you still feel that way oh of course definitely i think i can sit here talking to you and it sounds really confident you know but i'm sure when i drive away i'll be like what idiotic things did i say today you know yeah so well it's it's interesting uh just getting to know you the past couple months of making this you know video workshop Mm -hmm. and just like observing our social interaction, there are certain times where I see certain things like working in your head <laughs> and I I can tell you're kind of second guessing yourself on certain things, but I'm like, man, you're a master artist at this point, whether you like think of yourself yeah, that way or not. I appreciate the, <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. In the technical sense, a hundred percent, I think, you know, you, you have definitely achieved things that people want to achieve with their artwork right and then within that technical ability i mean just at least from me understanding your career you know it's like Mm -hmm. you took that within illustrating Mm -hmm. right at first and and with illustrating you have to have like a good understanding of technically how things Mm -hmm. develop right and now you're going more in the path of understanding yourself from a personal perspective and and you're saying yourself as a fine artist, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess where I'm going with this is like, how did, how has that transition been for you? It's been really, I think, beneficial in the last couple of years just to kind of, because getting into illustration, like anything, was just a big s- struggle for me. But there's so many roads you can go with art. And so you can go the college route, which is really beneficial. But then there are a lot of traps in that. Or you can be like me, which school I always associated with bad feelings. So it was like pressure to do something that I know I can do it, 
but how do you motivate yourself to do that? So it was always overwhelming, you know, this class and this class and this class. It's always the thing that scared me about any kind of education is being exposed to all these other things that might be good for me, you know, but just being completely overwhelmed by that. And so um, that was not the route that I wanted to go out of pure, probably pure fear and laziness at first. So I wanted to get, which is funny because illustration is so difficult, you know, that you cannot be lazy in it at all. So I just figured that I just wanted to start drawing and that was the only route that I knew how to have any kind of career. Because I started to meet more and more people who worked in the comic book industry, which was a big part of my childhood um, visually. Like I've, I've been embarrassed to say I never really read a lot of the comics. I knew the basic origins of the characters and all that, but it was just the art was so incredible. And you have to you have to be able to draw everything. You know what I mean? And you have to be able to almost stereotype everything in a perfect way to tell the story. So that was the route I wanted to get into. And I thought that's what I want to do for the rest of my life is I love stories. I want to be a storyteller. And I think, yeah. you know, recently I found out that I don't really necessarily visually with art want to tell a story. I would love to eventually maybe make a short film or something like that. Because that's the real storytelling that I really love. And that's what I found out is at the end of the day, like I watch movies, you know, and occasionally read novels, but mm -hmm. it wasn't necessarily the thing that I went home and would read comic books. So after years and years of doing that, I thought like, well, that's kind of an insult to people who are actual comic book artists, you know, who have loved this stuff their entire life and continually work to get better at it and yeah. to make these deadlines. And it started to seem again, like I was in school all over again, trying to illustration became a thing where I was just like forcing myself to do a, maybe styles that I wasn't comfortable with because you're making money, you know, and it felt really, really good to make money um, from the art, even though it was not a lot at all, but just to kind of get a little bit of freedom from sort of, sort of a system. I don't know. Yeah. It's a really long winded answer. But. No, I know. I, I, I mean, I, yeah, I understand that. Um, but has illustration, uh, when you were first doing illustration, you know, during that time period, was there more of a viable career path in doing illustration, uh, you know, in terms of making money for yourself? For me, it seemed that way because it did. And it is such a long road to any kind of financial stability being a fine artist, you know, because trying to think someone else is going to necessarily get what you're trying to express on this personal level is it's a risk. Because you're not going to make any compromises with the visual image. And that's the thing I love about fine art is that to make it that... Because it's all, it's all a fine art. Even illustration is of fine quality, you know. But there's obviously the big difference is taking someone else's idea and developing that versus something that comes from yourself. Even if it's looking at something that everybody knows and translating that. It's how do you translate it, you know. And that's what I always liked about making illustrations is that first part after all the sketches and all the concepts executing it, I always loved it. And even if the changes that were always inevitably asked for were good, it always would break my heart, you know? So I've never, I was never, never had a hard enough, strong enough mind to just put that aside the way the great illustrators do, you know, even if it breaks your heart, they just get right back in there and they make the changes as if yeah. everything yeah. is supposed to be that way. And it looks mm -hmm. beautiful. But for me, I'd always end up ruining the image in my mind mm. and it would just be too heartbreaking. So I wanted to, that's really the answer of why did I switch from illustration to fine art is I just want to stop messing with something that I see as magical, even if it isn't improved. What does that even mean? Honestly? Well, I think it's just, you know, I'm assuming that you're saying that from an observational standpoint mm -hmm. in terms of like viewing other illustrators work and like how they approach clients because I feel, mm -hmm. I mean, because you know, it's this, it's a very similar thing with directors and commercials mm -hmm. and it's also about the way that you approach it too. You know, it's like, Oh, did this person bring me onto this project for me to express my personal point of view or is it more so that they want me to recreate something and a lot of the times with i think illustration it could be both mm -hmm. no that's a good point though yeah it could be both right but i think it's a, about the way that you approach the project because if you you know at least that's the way that i had to change my mindset is that i have to shift from 
it being a personal thing to it being a service oriented thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, and there's a fine line between that because it is a creative thing that someone is asking you to create, you know, mm-hmm. even with like a commissioned art piece, you know, they might like the way and the style of how you create an art piece, but mm-hmm. at the same time, they m- might want you to paint a silly photo of, of their dog or something. Sure. That's a really good point. Yeah. Because you, yeah. you wonder like how much of you quote unquote, do they want in there? How much of the, maybe the subject matter or the story is going to lead the way. Mm-hmm. So what, I mean, what for you, is it always more satisfying doing more of the personal stuff or do you also find satisfaction in, you know, the jobs? Well, for me, I've, I've just learned how to channel, how to funnel things into different ways Mm -hmm. and how to also have distance from projects that aren't my personal mindset. You know, Mm -hmm. actually it was really interesting. I was listening to, uh, Stephen Pressfield's book, the war of art. That's a great book. And, um, he was talking about how he incorporated himself. So mm-hmm. it's basically like drawing the line. So it's like Nick Rungi incorporated. Right. Mm-hmm. And so with Nick Rungi incorporated, you run it like a business, you approach things in different ways. You, uh, you know, you may take illustration projects, but understanding that you're servicing the client. So you make, so it's, So for me, it's like with no wave, I can approach things not from a personal standpoint and take on projects in a way that it's like, how is this good for the business as a whole? And not so much, how is this good for me and my career? Uh, If that makes sense. I think a lot of it is figuring out devices and approaching things in like different ways to be able to navigate uh, more clearly, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. And I mean, what you guys have created with no wave is just incredible. So no, thanks I, man. Yeah. Well, trust me. It's all just being a part of it. Something I, that I thought before, if I would have told myself, I'd be like, that's absolutely never going to happen. You know? <laughs> so what do you mean? Oh, just to, to the, the artists you work with. I mean, they're so inspirational to me, you know? So, um, I just, I mean, I you're part like you're part you, of it, man. I, <laughs> You're part, we're all we're this all is here all uncomfortable we're all here go down the, that road you know so we're all like, here together yeah. man let's do it we're just out here doing it man i don't know, <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. yeah exactly i think like starting out with illustration is you have no say at all because like the skill level i was at was so low you know that you're just so happy to get any kind of job you mean money. in the beginning exactly yeah in like 2005 yeah. around that time when it was actually starting to be a twinkle in my eye as far as like oh maybe i could do this again sometime with people and create something else you know Mm -hmm. but you're just so eager to get anything that not only was i afraid to start to put my own spin on things but i didn't even know what that was at all so Mm -hmm. once you start to figure that out more then it becomes either more beneficial or more frustrating to deal with clients who have seen your work up to that point because of course they want you to do that style again, you know, and you start having this voice in your head that maybe I don't really enjoy doing it like this at yeah. the time. So what were the types of projects that you were getting brought on to? So at first it was all co- just comic book stuff. So it was any kind of like, maybe I'll get to do a little bit of inking practice. Yeah. Or I always wanted to do penciling jobs, but yeah, but how much lines are so crazy. Yeah. Know? I mean, even with the comic book market, I mean, it's an interesting thing to think because, you know, during 2005, uh, print is a much more viable option in general Mm -hmm. as opposed to now, right? Yeah, and even then, all they were talking about is how it was dying in in that industry. Yeah. I can't imagine So they're aware of it. Yeah, so now it really is kind of a niche market. If you don't mind me asking, how much were you getting paid per, and how would you get paid per (laughs) page or... What would it, so little back at back the time, then? You know, yeah. I mean, I I don't even know what a good rate is now for like Marvel or DC per page for like a penciler because that's what I consider. If you're talking about the industry, you know, different independent. Did you work people. for Marvel? No, I didn't. But at or first DC? it was really tiny yeah. little companies, and mm-hmm. then it was all of a sudden companies that were kind of small then that are now gigantic, like IDW, and so I had a lot of. They were the company I did the most work for. Um, 
just really really nice guys really cool yeah but it was nothing i mean at all like at first the first book i worked on i think i did like four 22 page issues for like twenty five hundred dollars or something which is you break that down and it's yeah it's you don't ever ever do something that cheap you know yeah um i was just always intimidated by everything and i was working way too early and i think if you have good discussions with people and you go to the conventions enough and you just start becoming friends with people they genuinely like want to help you out you know and they think well there is some maybe some talent here and try to develop it but their heart might be in you and your heart isn't even in yourself you know and that's how i kind of felt i was always just like pretending to yeah i'll get this done on time and then really believing that i was going to be able to somehow magically draw all those pages on time yeah it was just going to start clicking or something and it just never started clicking so it always felt behind and it was 10 years of feeling behind even when i got more into painted movie poster type stuff again the amount of work that goes into that for an independent person this day and age versus someone who actually worked for a studio back in the day with a huge budget you're basically working for free. Yeah. Back in the day, meaning like in the seventies, eighties before computers started to come in. So yeah, I love computers and hate them equally. I think because all of this, we're talking all of Instagram, all of that stuff. That's been such a huge tool in a career. It's all the computer. But then Mm -hmm. with art, digital art is amazing. I know a lot of our digital artists that are far beyond what I could do and they're doing it digitally. So that's to me, just a tool when you're talking about how something's created, but As far as what it's taken over with commercial art, it's very difficult to be a traditional artist and keep up, you know, and and I think the people who survive now do both and they do it really well. Yeah. I was never great at digital art. I just never got very motivated. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, like understanding the creative landscape and figuring out what jobs are necessary and what jobs will potentially be cut out. Mm -hmm. I think... I mean, this is just an assumption, but also understanding like the visual landscape. I feel like agencies and people that are interme- intermediaries between artists and client probably won't exist on a traditional standpoint anymore, mm-hmm. which is why, you know, Justin and I have invested so much time too in, into uh, the art collective mindset, mm-hmm. you know, but... I think it's, it's, it's just different. You know, it's like artists working with artists to create these different things, these different channels essentially. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think in order to survive as a creative, now you have to understand the channels and understand the pathways for visual artists to make money. Definitely. Yeah. And you know, if we want art to survive in the commercial marketplace, it has to be digital in a way. It's just, it would, it it would be dumb not to be, you know, it's the modern world. Um, I just always feel so good when I have something in my hands that's, yeah. you know, even if it's two dimensional art, it's still almost like a sculpture just the way, you know, depending on how someone paints something and how, how deep it is, even, you know, the layers of paint and stuff, if you yeah. become three dimensional and I just love the feel of creating an object, but for sure, visually everything becomes digital. If you want to show it to anyone, if they're not standing right in front of it, they're seeing it, you know, Mm -hmm. on the computer or on their phone. Exactly. It's inevitable that way, but that's the whole deep argument you could get into that I love to get into between 35 millimeter film or 16 millimeter or digital, you know, what do you prefer? It doesn't, I prefer film, but I also know that it's not how you capture something. It's what you do with that capture how you present it, you know, to tell your story. That's what makes it a movie to me or, or legitimate yeah. is not whether it's film or digital. I just love, I love the timelessness of film. Yeah. I don't love the film grain and all the old, old looking parts of it. You know, mm-hmm. that's nice. when if you want to look nostalgic, but if you want to just tell a story, I just, I think it looks timeless, but now 35 millimeter is so almost indistinguishable from, uh, you know, digital capture that, it's cool to see certain big movies shot on like 16 millimeter. Yeah. It really plays to film's strength. You know, it's not mm-hmm. eight millimeter, so you can actually tell a, a story with it on a big professional level, but it's also got that quality that I like. Um, it's yeah. just personal preference, you know? Yeah. And I think that is always going to translate to the art too. It's an interesting topic because what we're talking about is medium and content. Mm-hmm. And the intermix between medium and content, right? Exactly. So I've always been under the impression that 
it comes from the artist's mind first. Mm-hmm. So whichever medium you choose to convey an idea, it'll translate. Totally. Whether, I mean, you know, there's certain technical abilities, like for instance, let's say uh, someone that is a photographer or mm-hmm. director that works more on with, with cameras, for instance, mm-hmm. you know, it has a certain eye for things, starts to paint. Mm-hmm. Like David Lynch, you know, David Lynch is a good example. Uh, and there's been, you know, painters that transition over to film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think we're just all trying to express ourselves s- some way. So even if you think, oh, I'm all my life has mm-hmm. been a visual artist, that's not to say that you couldn't try to write, be a writer or something. It's going to be pretty bad at first, I'm sure. But it's, it's, how well, it's just you, a muscle. Yeah. You just have to keep working it. Yeah. It's yeah. like if I just started to paint or to draw Mm -hmm. yes i have an understanding of what i like to see in composition but my technical ability in terms of my the muscle memory isn't quite there Mm -hmm. which might be interesting to look at but it's also it could be it could or couldn't right but it's just like these different mediums switching to different mediums it requires a certain muscle memory and some more than others like drawing for instance it's Mm -hmm. you know you have to have that I don't know. It's it's it's, it's yeah, practice, right? Exactly. It's yeah. like if I wanted to start sculpting, you know, I would be yeah essentially starting from square one. So if someone didn't see any of the paintings or drawings I've done, they'd be like, "Well, this is a person who clearly doesn't know what they're doing." You know what I mean? So it's how do you? It's hard to it's hard to think about being like an an artist instead of just a painter because then you have to decide. Well, I will. Does this does a painting always answer the questions you have for each project? Yeah. Of course not. But I just feel like I need to spend years and years getting up to a technical level in my mind that then you can break it down you yeah. know, in different ways. So right now with I think with watercolor, I just can it's kind of a clearer voice for me. But I really love oil painting. I mean, I love it probably more than anything at this point. But it's just something that I don't it's speaking to me in so many different ways, you know, there's not really a style yet. And I think that hopefully maybe other people can see something in it that I can't yet, because I really want to try to develop that. And that's how I see it is I want to get that to a comfortable level to where you can just translate anything either way. And I of course would love to do that with cameras or filmmaking or directing or cinematography, but that's a huge universe in itself. Yeah. And I don't think you need to go to film school to make a movie, but I also th- think that way about art. You don't need to go to college to paint a painting or draw a drawing, but it's beneficial. You know, mm-hmm. so what do you do with that information? Because a lot of there's a lot of agendas, and the package that they have to sell you has to follow a certain curriculum. You know, for sure, and they're trying to get you ready for the world now, and so in a certain way, they're saying that this is what's selling in the galleries. You know, so if you do something representational, like you're going to take, you're taking a huge risk, you know? And I think that changes a little bit now, which is, it's nice to see a lot of figurative art around, yeah. but, but I think um, there's just like, yeah, no, I mean, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Uh, there's just all these systems that are set up and a lot of it comes from intention. Mm-hmm. Art schools are, pro- are protecting their own, their own interests of course. So that people constantly sign up and make you believe that if you go to art school that you're going to be in, t- in a gallery and you know that there's these certain steps but mm-hmm. from actually working with professional artists you understand that that's not the not actually always a guarantee. that's not yeah. there's never a guarantee for for anything mm-hmm. right and if anything by going to art school yes there's really good teachers uh, and the potential to like learn these different techniques, which you can apply to different things. But a lot of the times it's just overpriced. Mm-hmm. If you're paying 20 to 40 grand a year, multiply that by four. Sure. And, you know, and also like trying to make a living and be an artist. I mean, it's mm-hmm. hard enough for professional artists just to make a living that have been doing it for 10 plus years. Oh, sure. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, it's just that there's so many pitfalls with, I think, in general, the American educational system that is that says that it will guarantee you these certain things mm-hmm. by graduation that, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just not, not a good system. Yeah, there's a lot of problems, 
for sure. Yeah, so, for sure. And there's there's so many like good teachers within that flawed system, you know, that I'm sure they feel the same way. Just mm-hmm. like I want to continue to have my teaching job and help these students, but at the same time, they're navigating a world that's insane, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it's like I always have felt that way too, where like art is it's. It doesn't matter what country you're from, you can make a great painting no matter what. Yeah. But I think it always is misunderstood by the general society of America and the artists too, like how they interact with each other. Because in the end of the day, it's all, it's, for me, it's nothing to do with the money, but that's a big factor in having the time to even make art at all. Well, know? it's a big factor so, in can, being able to and I don't think that's live. just an American thing, but it feels a lot of, like I feel a lot of pressure here. To, yeah. Hurry up and get a career, you know. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, people won't even look at your art, and yeah. I don't think that's necessarily true, but that's how it feels a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. I think there's also a, a certain flawed mindset with being an artist and addressing the ideas of money too, mm-hmm. because for a long time, at least for myself, you know, I would think of money as kind of like a dirty thing to discuss, mm-hmm. but I think we have to address that it is it's the giant elephant in the room yeah it's a lot something of the time. yeah exactly i mean you need to make money to be able to support yourself as as an artist you know mm-hmm. yeah i mean i always think of it like with yeah. with illustration it's almost like for me personally so you know <laughs> yeah i'm sure a lot of people will disagree but i yeah. thought of it like you're on this giant cruise ship and it's going in a certain direction so you have what you need you have a room you have a bathroom, you can get food, it's all contained, you know, but that ship is going to go where it's going to go. So if you all of a sudden decide, like, I'm not really too thrilled on where we're going, you know, you can always like take one of the lifeboats and a little bit of food and whatever supplies you need and head out on your own. But anything could happen in the ocean, you know, you could die instantly. But if you can somehow get to the island and hopefully it's an island that you want to be on because then you feel like well i really did struggle and i thought i was going to die but yeah then made it to this place that is the destination i wanted to be at but when you're on the cruise ship and you look out especially at night at the ocean and it's black and it looks just like 100 percent death you know all bad <laughs> you want to get in there you know sometimes i feel like jumping from illustration to fine art or, or whatever you sometimes can't even do it during the daytime, you know? It's such a bad time to do it. Yeah. Same with, like, finding an apartment or something. It just yeah. always seems like it's at the worst possible time Yeah. in your life. So, it's like you have to jump off that cruise ship with the little boat in, at night, you know? Yeah. Maybe even in a storm. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> depending on your bills and all this stuff exactly. at the time, you know? Yeah. And I like the cruise ship analogy. So, I mean, yeah. When it's, I think of cruise kind of ship, though. Maybe I, a little cheesy, but. No, no, I get, I get, I get the analogy. Any I, kind of big entity that you're a part of has yeah. an idea and it's a support system so the, it'd be nice to have more of a support system for illustrators and artists in the u.s i think as far as 100%. being able to get some kind of benefits or some kind of package that's not just oh you're responsible for your health insurance and for your rent and you have absolutely no backup or possibly no savings at all and good luck you know yeah that's almost guaranteeing that you're gonna die out in the ocean you yeah know? <laughs> america certainly doesn't support artistic ideas from a governmental standpoint yeah, at all and it's weird because like I, I feel like everybody here in the u.s really does love art you know like there is a huge desire for it um but yeah um being in spain for example this year it was just amazing how it's see and maybe it's just an illusion but it seems like it's more respected in a way yeah you can tell people you're an artist and Here, they're either really thrilled or they look at you like you're telling them that you learned how to fly or something. They're like, really? Like, how do you pay your bills? You know? Exactly. And there's always... It's pretty interesting to see people's eyes glaze over when you talk about, oh, I'm an artist. Sometimes that's why I don't like to use that word because it's so broad in general, you know? Yeah. You really can literally be an artist in almost any walk of life. If you care about what you're doing, then you're putting a little bit of not ab- maybe visual abstraction, but just a little abstract thought into it. You know, a lot of people are artists and they don't know it, yeah. I think, for sure. Or they just don't care enough to want to identify as that or something, mm-hmm. you know. So. Exactly. Yeah, I think the arts are supported 
in America. And now, you know, going back to this sort of like macro socioeconomic standpoint of Mm -hmm. America, but, um, I think the arts are supported in America if it supports big business. Yeah. I mean, definitely seen because there's, there's art anywhere. There's function, there's Mm -hmm. ergonomics, there's, you know, a cup is technically a, an, or a mug is technically an art form room or any room is designed. Yeah, it's so designed. There is a little bit of art in all of it. Like, why does why does the mug have to be this certain shape? I mean, there's a certain functionality, obviously, to it, but everything else is aesthetic. So, yeah, exactly. People don't think of themselves as artists. They'll be like, "Well, I'm an artisan, maybe." Yeah, I have a lot of skills, but yeah. What do you find yourself speaking of aesthetics? Mm-hmm. What do you find yourself expressing mostly as of recently? Is it more so an idea, or is it uh, or like uh, something that you want to express mm-hmm. from a personal standpoint, or is it more so like an aesthetic standpoint and a studying standpoint? Yeah, it's really, and this is the part where I think like, oh, how am I supposed to like answer that? Some kind of intel- halfway intelligent answer. I mean, I always describe it as just a feeling recently. Like I just want a certain feeling when someone looks at one of the portraits. Yeah. That, I want it to feel like, oh, that's me. Like, I'm. this is who I am inside. And so I don't know if that's the subject matter. I don't know if they think there's a story in there, even if yeah. it's a person doing a certain thing. I'm not necessarily saying, look at this person welding or something. The reason that image was interesting to me was the color and the composition. And it's just like, how do I That's how do an I older image of yours, something? too, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, a lot of those are. Because it kind of it kind of did start telling stories, you know? And I feel mm-hmm. like if I want to tell stories, it would be in a different medium. Yeah, it's so general, but it really is just the feeling. Um, it can be almost completely representational or almost completely abstract. Um, but I think it was just, like everything, I'm just stubborn. So if things become comfortable, then I feel this need to just rebel against it in a weird way. So as soon as I got comfortable in illustration, especially in the movie poster kind of montage thing, then all of a sudden I started to feel that fear again. Yeah. Like there's still a lot to learn technically, but was I feeling like I was really creating anything that had that feeling of me inside, you know? So hopefully when people look at the portraits, they see me, but. Also, I look at art, too, and I think there is a big tendency to try to compare it or to tell someone, oh, this this looks like this person's art as a compliment. You know what I mean? But that compliment can also sit with that person or with me, for sure, and kind of torment them, I think. Yeah. Into taking something that is really good, and then they don't want to do that again because they're like, well, they thought it looked like this person. So, Well, well, it seems like if it would torment you that... Maybe that's kind of a dramatic word, but... Well, I mean... Yeah, it, it is. It is a dramatic word, but but I I understand where that comes from. I think that comes from maybe some, you know. I mean, you're on this new path of discovering yourself mm-hmm. and self expression within the arts, within your own artwork, right? Yeah, and, I'm trying to just be like a sponge, really. So, yeah, every and every day I want to learn about a new artist. So. Yeah, but I think if you know if people compare your artwork to someone else's, then you might because you're on this sort of like path of self-discovery that you might take it upon yourself because prior, you know, doing illustration, you are Mm -hmm. doing essentially what you're told, you know? And so I think, yeah, I mean, it it would make sense why if someone points out, Oh, this looks like someone else, then you would get offended by that. Yeah. And it's like, no, of course. Yeah, And that's the natural feeling I think is to, get offended but then i also have to look back and think of how much of that is just fear and ego and just vanity of being like oh i can't believe someone would make this honest you know uh connection yeah. sometimes it can be helpful too where it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to feel bad about it but you can just use it as a tool mm-hmm. if i'm going to paint this way this is the how it's going to look and it's naturally going to draw this kind of attention to it you know mm-hmm. so i hate th- I think with illustrations, you have to you have to over not overthink things, but think about them so much to have a plan yeah. to get it done and be able to make changes on it. That's the professionalism. I don't. I hate when people think, 
oh, well, I can take this job and then I can just not turn it in on time or I can just do whatever I want, you know? And yeah. That's what they want. They want me to be me, right? It's like, well... No, they, they want not to pay you to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully your sensibilities come through. Exactly, know? yeah. Being on a movie set and some actor wants to change lines around or something and you just have to wonder, like, is it for them or the whole production, you know? And, and that, is that how, yeah. how unprofessional can you be if you really feel that it is good for the project you know yeah and how does that make other people feel are they even going to see your vision or are they just going to think that this person is difficult you know so that's what i just would be afraid yeah. when i did illustrations that i was becoming that person yeah so there's I thought, well just do your own thing then mm -hmm. and don't fool people into thinking you're going to do exactly what they want when in your heart you don't want to because then it's going to be really difficult for you to do that yeah. you're going to seem unprofessional when you're really really overthinking it you know i think there's a fine line between i mean especially when you're bringing up if you're an actor and getting casted for a film mm -hmm. and then you come up with your own lines i mean there's uh famous examples of that like marlon brando oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and you know just he's so good though you have to be like well <laughs> but then that example can be used the other way too you know? well i mean you're there's like, oh you're the writer now then huh yeah i <laughs> forget i forget what it was called uh, the, there was this one film that I, I think he completely disregarded all of the director's notes and everything that was written for him mm -hmm. in the script That's and just probably apocalypse now i mean no no, no it wasn't it was apocalypse now i know he used to write was, uh, write lines on the ceiling and stuff because you yeah. forget them and then you'd be looking at the lines but then it comes across as always oh, thinking really yeah. deeply and there's yeah he's just such a great example of um the way acting changed from the stage to all of a sudden knowing that the camera is going to see everything so you can be really quiet and kind of yeah you know um, yeah i think in apocalypse now he showed up completely overweight which he was embarrassed about you know it's not like he wanted to do that and yeah but then it works so well in the movie because he just couldn't light him at all you just have to keep them all in darkness. So all of a sudden, <laughs> the heart of darkness is born. You know, it's yeah. like <laughs> Colonel funny. Kurtz is real. Where it's like, if yeah. you would have shown him in the bright light and everything, it probably would have taken away from that mystique. Because then you think like, oh, yeah. well, he did. He lost his mind in the jungle. You know, and like put on a little bit of weight. And like everyone thinks he's a god. Yeah, something. especially Dennis Hopper. You know, and so a rational person gets there, you realize like, oh, he's he is completely insane. You know, and he's, he was perfect. But that's got to be just so frustrating to work with you know i mean in that case it takes a really good director like francis ford coppola mm -hmm. to be able to understand and survey the landscape yeah. and to figure out how to navigate it and to create a film that he's proud to put out there yeah. well and i mean i've heard other directors say that he loved to work in a state of chaos so that's true too yeah that's true i mean a lot of it i think about creating good artwork is about relinquishing control mm-hmm and being able to navigate, you know, going back to your cruise ship analogy, navigate, yeah. <laughs> you know, you ju jump out onto the on the paddle boat and figure out how to, you know, fend off the sharks and get onto the island. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, I was curious, since we were talking about movie posters, which movie mm -hmm. posters did you do while you're illustrating? I mean, most of them were just private commissions. So they were set up to be very much in the uh, Drew Struess and Richard Amsel type of look i mean that was part of the reason that i wanted to have my own voice eventually is they're you'll, I'll, you'll never be as good as those guys at doing what they did like no one will ever so having that brought up all the time gets a little irritating because i think like well i'm really glad someone would compare me to that on a technical level but then you'll never have your own thing so the only real actual movie poster i did was um for the late john schnapp's uh documentary the death of superman lives about the crazy Nicolas Cage Superman movie that almost happened with Tim Burton in oh, the okay. late 90s. I didn't, yeah, know. And it was, I, I didn't know about that one. John was just so nice and so kind to to be one of the people that actually wanted a traditional movie poster, you know. And it was, this was like three years ago. So now I see a lot of them around, which is kind of cool. A lot of movies are using that again. So maybe there is hope for that, but it didn't feel very hopeful. Um yeah being somebody with no money and no time and all that kind of stuff, trying to just pay all the bills to keep doing that style, you know? And it's so much about the story and the subject matter mm -hmm. that sometimes I'll look at some of those movie posters and they're, they're pretty, but I just feel like, Oh my God, like what was I doing? You know? And then other times I look back and think like, Oh, these are some of the best things I've ever done. So it's weird. 
I think it's just a completely, I feel like a completely different person in such a short amount of time. Yeah. I don't know. But then I also feel like 10 years from now, I don't think I will have changed as much as I did between 2014 and 2016. Then I maybe now in the next 10 years or something just from being working with you guys and doing the workshops and things. It's just opened up a whole new avenue, I think. For in what artistic. way? Because now I feel like there is more of a voice. Like I do have, even if that sounds crazy or something, I feel like there's an easier way to express myself and know that people want to see that. Instead yeah. of trying to rebel against something that you have no business rebelling against, which is the client, you know, because they're well, paying you. So. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, goes back into the idea of tribes and community. Mm-hmm. Because if, oh, totally. like, if you're the black sheep of the village, for instance, mm-hmm. then you're going to constantly think that you're the black sheep of the village. But if you come from that mindset that you're the black sheep, but then you find a bunch of other people that are black sheep, and you don't, yeah. then oh, no. you don't feel so crazy anymore, oh, no. do you? Now I feel like, oh, I'm not rebellious at all, you know? Yeah. I mean, looking at this painting here, I'm like, this is amazing. We're looking at a Timothy Wilson piece. Timothy, if you're listening, we're looking at your piece that's in my house. You are a master. <laughs> Seriously, like that. And to me, I want to do stuff more like that. But then I think, well, that's got to come in a natural, in the natural amount of time, you know? Yeah. It has to be something unconscious. It can't be. During the, illust- the illustration years, I got so used to being like, oh, they want this style. Let's try to break down that. And you, I always hit a wall, which is like, you're not that person. Good luck trying to get into their head. And why would you? Don't yeah. you want to be yourself? You know? So. That's the new thing about the last few years is being able to know that you can love something and not know that you're not going to be able to create something in that style or look, Yeah, even if you tried and just Mm kind of to try to get over that. I mean, I think there's a lot of life lessons if you're conscious about seeing it within yourself. You don't even have to be an artist necessarily, but trying to dissect the certain things that you do and the way that you approach the things that you do, you mm-hmm. know, for us, it's like we can approach it in a more artistic form, but being able to dissect those things and to be able to figure out meanings for yourself. The answers are there is pay. what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. The answers are all there. Mm-hmm. Go on. Sorry. No, I'm sorry. I'm interrupting there. Yeah, I agree. The answer is always, I think, in, right in front of us, but sometimes I feel like good luck trying to see, see it, you know? Yeah. And, it's hard to see outside of ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And maybe we're not supposed to in a way. It's just like, I just I just want to keep painting and creating. That's really the end goal right there. So in a way, it's like I'm already doing what I want to do, even if I had a billion dollars or something. That's not going to make you any better at painting or drawing, all having all that. It'll make you maybe more relaxed in a way, because um, you never have to worry about bills ever again. So obviously, that's going to be easier. But then there's all of the new challenges that come with that. Yeah. Um, how to manage all the new ideas that you want to get into. And it's also a way to like lose your mind too, getting into too many things at once. So the nice thing about not having money is that you really have a kind of a limited option. You have limited options for the day. Yeah. For me, I just want to paint during the day and then go home. You know, that's about it. So I, if I can keep doing that, then success and, yeah but yeah there's i think there's a lot of pressure sometimes when you walk into a gallery and you see a price on a painting and it's fifty thousand dollars or something yeah it doesn't seem like something that will ever happen and that doesn't i mean who knows about the future but that stuff kind of scares me in a way because then when i'm painting i think like how do you <laughs> how do you make something that's gonna justify that price you know yeah and i don't think that has anything to do with the painting itself so it's probably good not to overthink that exactly it's one thing to paint the painting from your heart and then eventually you see that painting later and it's selling for a ton of money yeah you can think like well that one was definitely from my heart but then when you get to the point where you're hopefully making a lot of money on each painting i just wonder if now there's a lot of pressure in someone's mind but i have no idea yeah you know yeah um I think the main thing is just well, you're not well, you're not painting. necessarily in charge of, or, or not in charge, point. but you're not in control of 
directly in control of how much your paintings can sell for. Sure. Right. A lot of it has to do with people that put you in those positions to be able to sell your pieces for that Mm -hmm. amount of money. Of course. And and like, you know, some people are, I mean, look at Jeff Koons, right? Mm -hmm. Jeff Koons was a banker or he was in the financial industry, right? And Mm -hmm. then basically create artworks to sell to all of his friends. Sure. Right. So I don't know, man. I mean, some people just know how to work the game and, uh, we're still figuring it out. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's hard to even talk about it cause it's, there's so many thoughts yeah. that go through my mind. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. it literally is just day to day for me. So yeah, for sure at this point in time, I feel like I'm, I wake up and paint watercolor so that I can express myself and they don't always work, but try to express myself a little bit and get some kind of motivation from that. Yeah. And then spend the rest of the day messing with oil paint, yeah. trying to take that journey. So, yeah. You know. What What do you think about uh, artificial intelligence creating artwork? Oh, wow. That's a whole, it's so interesting. It, part of me thinks that it's never creating it because we created the artificial intelligence. Okay. But that can get into a whole tangent of the religious stuff. Of are you really painting or drawing or is it just this entity that's giving you this gift to do it? You know what I mean? Hmm, that's some interesting metaphysical things. Yeah, because yeah. like with the artificial intelligence, what would they think of us? Are we God to them? Or are we just this biological being that created we, a machine? You know what I mean? So We're either gods I think it's or interesting. Ants. Yeah. But when people <laughs> say, like, look what... <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> look what this robot made. Well, did it make it? Or did we tell it to you know if it truly comes up with something original then i'll have to eat my words you know yeah i read an article recently that there was an artificial intelligence created art piece that sold for four hundred thirty thousand dollars i think it was some sort of artificial intelligence painting um i'll have to find the article and send it to you yeah that'd be great yeah i don't know i always think about those things about it's kind of a fear in the back of my mind of artificial intelligence uh, and like, you know, like Skynet taking over sort of a situation. Yeah. I just imagine downtown Los Angeles, you know, in a mushroom cloud. (laughs) Oh, I know. Right. (laughs) Right. On the outside of my window. (laughs) And you're just like, you know, like my flesh, like, like, like melting off my face, basically. Terminators knocking on the door. Well, they wouldn't knock on the door. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hello. (laughs) Hello. Hey, you in there? Yeah, yeah, with their red eyes. I just look through the eye hole and then just see two red he, dots. He knocks on the door in the first movie. Yeah. Sarah Kana, you know? <laughs> yeah. Sarah, is this you? Yeah. Oh, he, he, that, that's, my that's my friend's That's my French version of <laughs> Arnold over, Schwarzenegger. No doors. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man, he's the, the most fun impersonation anyone can ever do. Dude, yeah, he is, <laughs> he's yeah. an interesting figure. Mm-hmm. Many careers in, in one man. Um, totally. Cool, man. Uh, thinking if there's anything else. I feel like we got into a lot. It's, again, just super excited to be on this podcast. Oh, yeah. No worries, yeah, man. Yeah. I loved listening to all the episodes. And they're so great when you're painting, just to have a voice in your head talking about all the things, or some at least some of the things that you might be thinking about while you're working. So it's really motivational for me. So. Well, thanks, man. I'm yeah, glad that. You that you like it so <laughs> i'm glad to have you on man yeah and it's been good to be able to work with you for the past couple months and it's been so amazing yeah so educational yeah definitely um, i just can't wait to keep up with no wave too it's a one of those organizations that is really doing things i think different than differently than a lot of groups it's, and you guys obviously have an aesthetic sense of the kind of visual art you know that you want to represent you but within that it's it's completely different which is cool there's so many different voices um thanks man it doesn't feel like a, this competitive thing but i think a lot of galleries can feel like it's yeah just, you know i don't know i like it <laughs> <laughs> thanks man well we like we like you man i yeah. like you man cool well this is a like fest right yeah now. oh wait one more question do you have any advice for people that want to choose art as a career path? From personal experience, I would say get ready for the long game. 
because it's going to be many, many, many years of questioning yourself. And, um, but I think if you know that it is the thing at the end of the day that you're most interested in, just don't worry about what other people say because you'll hear things from one person that completely contradict someone else and there might be people that you respect equally. So who do you listen to at that point? It's impossible. I just think if it is the, the thing that inside, at the end of the day, just ask yourself, what do you like to do? Because that's, I think, the answer to what you want to be as a person. So yeah. if it is truly painting or drawing or sculpting or any kind of art, just keep doing it every day. A little part of it, just find some part of the day. Because it's like working out. You're not going to want to do it. And sometimes you're not going to want to do it most of the time. When I first got, again, out of starting in college and then not finishing there and the idea of creating art was just so overwhelming that i didn't want to do it yeah but most of the time just keep doing it <laughs> hopefully one day that it'll click that yeah you'll get that good feeling i like it <laughs> all right thanks man thank you all right <laughs>